I do open closets with a new lens. I think about <laughs> my kids who are in their 20s now, but yeah, I'm like, I do not want to burden them at all. And, you know, it is true. They don't want your stuff. You know, and ask them, you know, I ask my kids, tell me what you want. And they actually like some of my stuff. But if the kids tell you they don't want it, they don't want it. Believe them. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the Kamari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified Kamari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. It's a rite of passage almost no one will escape. The difficult emotional journey of downsizing your home or your aging parents' home. Today's guest is going to help us navigate this sensitive exercise that often involves sorting through a lifetime's worth of possessions and memories. Our guest today is Marnie Jameson. She's a nationally syndicated columnist, author, journalist, TV guest, speaker, and America's most loved home and lifestyle expert. Her weekly column, At Home with Marnie Jameson, appears in papers nationwide, reaching millions of readers. An award-winning journalist, Marnie is also the author of five books, including Downsizing the Family Home and Downsizing the Blended Home. Welcome to Spark Joy, Marnie. Well, thank you for having me. What a pleasure. Welcome, Marnie. We're so glad to have you today. Thank you. Marnie, your deep dive into downsizing came from a very personal moment in your life and a desire to honor your parents' legacy. Can you share some of your journey and what led you to walk through this experience in such a public way, especially through your book, Downsizing the Family Home, and some of the other articles that you've written about this experience? So I have been writing a national home design column since 2003, and I was published in papers across the country and my readers often give me feedback and it's basically going through life and what I'm encompassing or encountering and how to live a little better on a budget and with messy kids and husbands that don't share your standards, that sort of thing. And I started on this process of downsizing my parents' home back in, gosh, five or six years ago. And Man, I didn't think it was going to be so hard. My dear parents got to be age 89 and they weren't uh, doing a very good job of keeping themselves or their house up. So they needed to move into assisted living. And I was living in Florida and they lived in California. And I um, decided to come in for a week and clean out their house and help get it ready to sell. And man, oh man, oh man, I had no idea what I was stepping into. And my brother was on the West Coast helping them get transitioned into an assisted living center. And being the only girl in the family, my lift was take care of the house. And I started writing about it. And I have never in the history of writing this column received so many emails. And I had so many people saying, Marnie, I'm saving all your columns to give to my kids or, or I'm saving all your columns to give to my parents, you know, don't, that we hope they don't leave a mess to us like this is. And anyway, I just realized I really had struck a nerve. And I started writing about the process of clearing out my family home and I mentioned it to my agent and said, I think I have a book here and, and here we are. Sure enough, three books later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really loved your book, Downsizing Family Home. And I thought it was interesting how you mentioned that every child someday will face a parent's mortality and by extension, the contents of that parent's household And this fact is really inescapable. I mean, considering how emotional this process is, where does one even begin? Yeah. And, you know, I think another thing to keep in mind is if you get married, you're often doing it for your spouse's parents or, you know, you can deal with this four or five times. And if your parents are separated or remarried, I mean, a lot of homes have multiple extensions (laughs) and some people have siblings and who never had children and they need to step in and take care of that. So this can hit you from a number of sides. There are two things that I like to keep in mind that one is it's, it's really hard as, as you both well know to take care of your own stuff and manage your own belongings in a responsible way. But when you're handling something that belonged to a dear loved one, it's once removed on the one hand, but it also makes it that much more precious 
And there's this huge responsibility that goes with that. You want to be fair and you want to be a good steward of your parents' things. You want to be respectful. You want to honor the family legacy and memory and history, but you can't take it all with you. So I think that you just have to be realistic about what it is you'll confront and brace yourself for what you're about to have to go through. It's very difficult. I know in my own experience working with clients that dealing with things that their parents have left behind is probably one of the most difficult challenges that someone faces. In fact, I have more than one client, maybe even a few that have chosen to just basically take everything from their parents' home, put it into a storage locker, lock the door and walk away because no. they just could not face managing or going through all of those things and trying to make decisions about what to do with them. So it is a very real thing and certainly something that you're absolutely right. Many of us will confront at least once in our lives. You know, and here at Spark Joy, we are big fans of the question, does it spark joy when it comes to making those decisions about what to keep and what to let go? But we also recognize that when you're deep in legacy management, there are many other questions that might come up. What kinds of questions did you find yourself asking yourself as you went through this process with your family treasures? Well, I think I I reminded myself that while everything is so charged and there's such a connection with so many items that you'll come across, they all spark so many memories that you simply cannot take it all. And when everything is important, nothing is important. And that's got to be one of your mantras. So I like to tell readers, and I tried doing this myself, to just rather than look at everything and say, what am I going to get rid of? Look at everything and say, what am I going to keep? Like Do a little reverse analysis and pick a few things that are really precious and dear and are connecting items to you and your family, you and your family's history. I have a painting that my mom really loved and it hung in her kitchen and now it hangs in mine. It came from France. It's some country chickens. And it just gives, reminds me of being in my mom's kitchen. I do have her china. I have her pearls. I wear them a lot. I don't have a lot of things though. And a few things from my dad, you know, a cigar box and brass can that he used to put his coins in and things that I can reflect on. But I don't have a lot of big things from my family. And I think it's important. I have enough. They're alive in my heart. I have pictures of them and fond memories and that's enough. So then we get to things like military memorabilia or college diplomas and things that meant a lot to them and really were precious to them at the time. And I think those are things, that, and this is very personal and I won't tell anybody to get rid of anything, but I chose to scan those and keep them in a an electronic file and a digital record to share them with my brother. And that's enough for me. Yeah, definitely. I love how you mentioned viewing things through a lens of what you are going to keep rather than how much you're going to let go. And I think that really makes sense when you're at the stage of dealing with a lot of sentimental things. And I imagine in that house, there were a lot of things that were clearly just important to your parents. I bet you maybe you found some things that were even yours in their home, maybe. And I would love to hear like how you were able to draw the line there and and make those decisions. Yeah, the childhood memories. I mean, my mom was pretty good about making sure my husband and I were fully booted out of the house (laughs) when he did (laughs) that. (laughs) <laughs> and I've done the same with my two children. Like, you know, they're off to, you know, college and most of their stuff is out of the house. I think that's important, first of all, for parents to not be a storage locker for their kids. Yeah, mm. very important. Yes. It's easy to, you know, well, mom, you know, I want you to hang on to my Cub Scout uniform, but honey, you're 32, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's time to move on. So I didn't run into a whole lot of that. And I have enough for me to remember my childhood. So it wasn't, you know, yes, it was hard to go in my old bedroom and see the, the paint that had faded around the high school year, the high school pennant that used to hang on the wall. The little triangle was still there as a ghost of my past. But mm. these are things you look at and you, you maybe you grieve or you have a moment of nostalgia and you work through it. And it's part of it. You know, it's very bittersweet. And I think it's just part of being human and part of moving through. You can't 
hold on to everything. And you have to learn to evolve and roll forward and be present in who you are now and what chapter of life you are in now. And one of the things that helped me when I was going through my parents' things was our end game. And my brother would, was helpful in this, help getting us to focus on my job was to clear out the family home and sell what was in it besides what we what we wanted, which wasn't that much, and liquidate to pay for my family's long-term care. And I think it's important to ask this question of everything, has it served its useful life? And all of the end tables and sofas and lamps and chairs and furniture had served the useful life of my parents, who were again now 89 and moving into an assisted living situation. They didn't need much furniture. So now we need to convert that asset into something they can use, which is the funding to take care of them in, until they die. So that was helpful to me when I thought about not that I'm getting rid of things, but I'm liquidating my parents' assets and turning it into something that will be useful for them. I found it also very interesting that with this whole idea of liquidating, that you mentioned that the average value of the things in the home, so not the land or the house, but just the things inside the home is $5,900, which (laughs) really puts things into perspective. I think in people's minds and in the narrative, sometimes that we tell ourselves that the things in our home are so valuable, but they're only really worth what the market or or someone else will pay for them. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest lessons. For me, it was a relief because I was doing things in a rather quick and hasty fashion just because I only had a week off work and I had to get back. And, you know, I worried that I was selling something that was worth a lot of money for for too low, Mm -hmm. but I needed to also move things along. And I found out that really things that your family may have thought had value very rarely has a lot of value, like antiques. I learned from some of my interviews with the antiques experts that to be an antique, you just have to be 100 years old. But to be a valuable antique, you have to be 100 years old or more in great condition and desirable. That's the key. It has to be something the market wants. So we had some old clocks that were over 100 years old that my dad had from his family. And they went for about $65. You know, they were antiques. They looked like they should be worth a lot, but they're just not. So it's kind of freeing. It may be disappointing, but mostly it's just freeing Mm -hmm. to let things go and realize that they have served their purpose and brought the joy to the family and would help them through, you know, decorate their home. But it's not that so valuable, you know? So I get, it gets just a little bit liberating. Back in episode number seven, Design and the Future of Minimalism with Lloyd Alter, he talked a lot about this idea that our kids don't want our heavy brown furniture. <laughs> and uh, we keep coming back to that. At least a lot of my clients do. This idea that, oh, yes, my kids are going to want the dining room set with the china cabinet and the buffet and the matching chairs. And the reality is, is that a lot of times our kids just don't want those things. Yeah. I think what's really challenging, though, and I'm sure that you can relate to this, this idea that the dining room table that you grew up with is not just the dining room table. It's every Thanksgiving that you had. It's all of these memories of doing homework at the table or sitting with your dad and your mom or getting ready for school or whatever it might be. The table becomes so much more than just a piece of furniture. And I think sometimes that's really hard for parents when they, you know, come to realize that maybe their kids still appreciate those memories, but they don't need the dining room sets here. Remember those things, you know, that the memories are in our heart, as Marie would say, and not necessarily you know, in the furniture, the china sets or whatever it is that, you know, take up a lot of room in our homes when we're downsizing. Tell us a little bit about what it was like to ask your family, your extended family to get involved in the process of downsizing. It was just my brother and me for my parents. But the whole thing about the dining room brings up a great point. I wrote Downsizing the Blended Home which came out last year. And that was, I got married five years ago, a second marriage for my husband and me. And he was a widower. When his wife died, he ended up with the whole house, right? It wasn't like she took half the things and moved on. And he has three grown children. 
And I was divorced, but had quite a bit of furniture. And I'm the home design columnist. So I'm like, oh, I got this. You know, I'll, I'll take care of decorating our place. <laughs> and he's like, wait, wait, I kind of like my stuff too. I don't want to feel like I'm living in your house. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? You don't want to feel like you're living in my house. My stuff's really great. And I listened to him and I, I'm like, you know what? He's right. I'm just saying, honey, I, I got this. I'll take care of the house decorating. And he really wanted to have a say. And we both really wanted our dining room tables. That's when, you know, his, he's like, well, my kids want to come in and see the dining room table that they grew up with. And my kids want to come in, you know, it's, it's very loaded. I think step one is, is as you point out, just to notice that, you know, we are attached to our things and to also realize that if you're blending two houses, one house plus one house has to equal one house. And you, you have to each give up half a house to make it a place that's yours combined. So we did have the extended family come in on these occasions and all of them were in a place of needing furniture, thankfully. And <laughs> I think they will always be in that place. You know, I have one daughter who's just starting a long college program and she was getting into her own condo and she could furnish her place with our stuff. And that was really great. So that's how our extended family worked out. So from my house went to his kids stuff from his house went to my kids. And I just loved that that worked out. That's amazing. It doesn't always work out so seamlessly. So I'm glad you really walked through what that well, it process. It wasn't always so seamless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you were able to, to walk through that and eventually compromise. And we talk a lot about how organizing home design, all of these things are just another platform or moment in your relationships where simply a compromise when it all comes down to it. So it's great that you guys found a, a middle ground there. And uh, who's dining table one? <laughs> well, <laughs> and that's kind of funny. Mine won, but we did compromise. And I was moving out of a house that I had been staging. I was a live-in home stager. And he was moving out of the house that he had been living in with his late wife for 17 years. And we both made a deal that I said, well, let's each ask the people who are buying our respective homes if they want to buy the dining room table because hmm. they can see what it looks like. And as it happened, maybe with some divine intervention, the folks who were buying his house wanted to buy his dining room furniture set. And he felt really happy that it would be staying in that home and that people really wanted it. And the folks that were buying the house that I was staging had their own dining room set, didn't want mine. So it came along. But in my book, I do talk about 10 other things you can do before you get somebody's feelings get hurt. You can look for a way to use the table as a desk or as an outdoor table or, you know, some repurposing it some way. You can use chairs from one set, the table from another to find some kind of a compromise. You can sell them both and buy a great table together. I mean, there are ways to do it. So... I think that is important. And you know what? It meant that I had to give in some other areas. I won the big round of the dining room table, but I let him have like a big say of the artwork that went in the family room, which wasn't my first choice. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. we made it work. <laughs> That's great. The question, does it spark joy, is a simple one, but not so easy to execute alone. Extend your tidying experience by joining the Spark Joy Club our online community filled with our clients, fellow listeners, and Kamari enthusiasts ready to support your journey. If you find yourself buried under clothing, stuck on storage, or pointing fingers at untidy housemates or family members, we want to help you finish your tidying journey once and for all. Support the show at the Joy Riser level and receive access to our exclusive virtual community, as well as the Tidy Home Joy Journal, your number one tidying companion. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click on Join the Club to get started. And now back to the show. Marnie, you mentioned that you leaned on a couple of professionals where you were trying to liquidate and uh, you highlight a series of professionals in your book that you consulted with along the way. Everyone from appraisers to estate salesmen, liquidators, professional organizers like ourselves. What criteria did you use when it came to deciding that it was time to reach out to a professional for additional expertise and accountability? 
So all that separates me from almost everybody else is I'm a journalist and I just come at this with a press pass. And so when I run into trouble, instead of hiring a professional organizer, which is a great thing to do or an estate salesperson, I wasn't doing this by design, but I would call them. Like when I was dealing with my parents, what I thought might be antiques, I was able to interview someone who worked on the Antiques Roadshow. And I was able to ask him questions, send him photos, and do my example. I would write columns. He would get the publicity. The show would get the publicity. I'd get the information, pass it on to my readers. So I got to learn by interviewing people. And that was really helpful to me. And I think it showed my readers the value of having appropriate appraisers or somebody with the expertise to look at things. I was making game time decisions, and I don't recommend people fire sell the way I was going through it. but. I think if there is anything of worth or considerable potential value, it is important that you have an appraiser come in. Like, let's say it's someone who specializes in antique oil paintings. It's important to have somebody with that kind of expertise. Just take a walk through and look to make sure if you have somebody that has any provenance or if there's a story in the family that this came over on the Mayflower or whatever, it's probably not true, but you should probably check it out. If you are going through things and you just find that you feel like your ankles are trapped in quicksand and you cannot move, it's important, I think, to get somebody who's impartial but caring and can come and hire a professional organizer to come with you and take you through that emotional journey of learning how to let go and really asking those deep questions. So I think people know when it's time. In my book, I talk about some siblings that were they were all in their late 50s, early 60s, and their last parent had died. And they went, they went and made every Saturday at the parent's house to try to get through all the stuff. And finally, one of the sisters just said, I just can't do this. I just have to hire their places like everything but the house, I think is one. There's another place called Maxold, where you bring in outsiders who liquidate everything in the house after the kids take what they want. And that may be what people need. So I think, you know, listen to your heart. Don't store it. Don't put it, don't pay money to store it. Deal with it. You really need to deal with it. So true. And we are also a big fan of everything but the house. Spark Joy episode 44, we interview Jackie and Brian, who are the co-founders. And oh. they talk a bit about uh, virtual estate sales. Excellent resource. Yep. I've used both them and Maxold. Maxold is very active here in the New York City area. And I think you're so right. It really makes a big difference to have an objective opinion about the value of things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if you learn that something that you thought was valuable is not means that you need to get rid of it, but at least it gives you the information you need to make an informed decision. So really agree with the importance of at least getting an expert opinion on things. And certainly an organizer can help you work through the different levels of decision-making. So let's say something's not worth what you thought it was. Is it still something important to you, something that brings pleasure and enjoyment to your life on a day-to-day basis? So even if something's not worth anything or what you thought it was, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place in your home. So I absolutely agree with that. I think it's important too that I think a lot of people want to make sure things go to a good home. And my parents' dining room table, for instance, there when we had all of our dinners at, it was we didn't have separate dining room. We just they always ate at the same table, and it was a well-made table and chairs. And when I went to sell it, somebody came and was going to offer like I don't know two hundred dollars for the whole thing. And for some reason, I couldn't sell it for that little, which was short-sighted of me. But what ended up happening was the little girl, the little girl, the girl across the street who was now a young woman with a child. She was a single mom of a child with disabilities. And I used to babysit her. I grew up and used to be her babysitter. And now she was, you know, single mom on her own and she didn't have a kitchen table and she took it for free. And I was so happy to give it to her for nothing. I mean, I get goosebumps, you know, just thinking about it. Like it was so much better than taking it for some little amount of money. So just knowing that it's going somewhere and it's helping someone that you care about, I think is just worth any amount you could get for it. 
And we talk about that a lot as one of the components of Kanma is this idea that if something is no longer useful to you, there may be and there probably is someone in the world who would benefit from it. And, you know, that's the reason that donating can be a, a great way to dispose of things that are no longer useful to you. Absolutely right. It's really important that the things that were important to you at some point find a new home if that new home is not with you any longer. Absolutely. What kind of tips do you have for a preemptive approach? So, for example, for those who are right-sizing or downsizing in place, so people who are not necessarily moving on to that smaller home or a retirement community, but they want to start thinking about it now and maybe getting rid of some of the superfluous things that have accumulated in their homes. Well, I would first say, can we clone you a bunch of times? Because I love (laughs) anyone who's thinking about living right sizing now is that's the name of the game. And what I have learned in this process, having downsized my parents' house and seen what that looks like, my husband's lost his mother, we downsized her house and living through the blending home situation is, wow, it's so much nicer when you let it go and you have less. and it is not a one and done deal. Living with the amount of things you need is a lifestyle. And that's what I try to practice and what I try to get across. It's not living like a monk. I'm not trying to get everybody to get rid of everything. And I love stuff. I just don't want to have something that is not me anymore, is not useful to me going forward, isn't who I am today. And I just think if you can constantly look through that lens and and have that filter on your life and just continue to look through whatever it is, your your kitchen closets, your your clothing closets, your linen closets, and your garage, and let go of, of things that were about who you used to be, that helps you make room for who you're going to become. I just think that's a great shedding process. It's just natural. Thank you so much for sharing that because it ties back to what we're always trying to get across here at Spark Joy that, yes, we start with the clothing in our closets, but ultimately this whole idea of organizing really does follow us across our lifetime, our lifestyle, and it does have a lasting impact. And I can imagine downsizing your parents' home. I mean, How has that influenced your family's legacy, what you're shaping now with your husband and children? Well, I do open closets with a new lens. I think about (laughs) my kids who are in their 20s now, but yeah, I'm like, I do not want to burden them at all. And, you know, it is true. They don't want your stuff, you know, and ask them, you know, I ask my kids, tell me what you want. And they actually like some of my stuff. But if the kids tell you they don't want it, they don't want it. Believe them. Believe them. them. So I think that's such a great lesson. And it's okay if they don't want it. It's not personal. It's just they want to have their own taste, their own belongings, and you need to let them do that. Marnie, since you're a home and lifestyle expert, we have to ask, what is your favorite hiding tip? Oh, gosh. Well, let me think. I have a couple. One is I'm very, very mindful, and I catch my husband on this all the time, of the excuses to not tidy up. And two phrases I listen for, and that it, my husband's good at saying, for now, is one of them. For now, we'll just put this right here. We'll just keep this for now, or we, we'll, you know, we'll keep two toasters for now. You know, no. <laughs> and the other one is later, you know, I'll deal with this later. I'll put this here. You know, it's, it's in the for now category. So I think if you catch yourself saying, I'll deal with this later, I'll deal with these papers later, or we'll put this here for now, have a red flag go up. That is a trap and it is a slippery slope because it's hard to get back to it. So deal with things in real time. I think that's one. And for me, the other is clear counters. It's not that you shouldn't have a pretty cookie jar or some, you know, plant on your kitchen counter, but put it away. It doesn't take two seconds to take the can opener out from underneath the counter, but there's such a visual harmony and a visual peace if everything is just off of the counter. So I can't go to bed unless the counters are clean and the papers have been dealt with. I think those will help you every day. 
That's a great tip, Marnie. And we also want to know what's sparking the most joy for you at this very moment. (laughs) Well, my yard. I am redoing my yard. My husband and I, we've lived in our house now for two and a half years, and we haven't ever done much with the yard. But what started it was we have three dogs. Don't get me started. How we got three dogs is another story. But they were running in and out of the house with all this mud where the grass wasn't growing well. And I'm like, oh, it's driving me absolutely bananas. You know, I, I just said, oh, we've got to, we've got to get a yard where the dogs aren't bringing mud in the house and it is underway. And I'm so excited. There's going to be beach rock where the mud used to be and some nicer patio and then solid grass. And we took the tree out that was causing the shade that was making the grass not grow. So there's more sunshine And we're getting a fountain coming in and a fire bowl. And I'm very, very excited about seeing this dream unfold. And I love home. I love a home that I want to be in. I think it's important to make it your sacred space. And I want to love coming home every day. And I do. So this is the last little piece that I think will make my oasis just what I want and keep some of the dirt out of the house too. (laughs) Marnie, how can our listeners get in touch with you? They certainly can email me anytime. I've got a website, MarnieJameson.com. You can email me at Marnie at MarnieJameson.com. I have a blog where if you don't get my column in your local newspaper, then I post that column on my blog three weeks after it's run in the newspaper so I don't scoop my editors. But you can see blogs on all sorts of lifestyle topics and I love to hear from readers. There's a place to put comments. I reply to those that have questions and I like to be engaged with you. So reach out. Perfect. And Marty, you also have an amazing offer for 10 Lucky Spark Joy listeners. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I have several books out, as you know. I've got Downsizing the Family Home and Downsizing the Blended Home. And I also have a workbook that is a really great place to chronicle the story of where things go. So say you're going through your parents' things and you don't, you really can't keep the wedding dress or the grandfather clock or grandpa's fishing tackle box, but you can take a picture of it or you can get a favorite fishing fly or take a snipping of the, of the veil and paste it in the book next to a picture of your mom on her wedding day and and have this in write write your story. So that's the workbook. And I think they're really nice companion pieces. The workbook along with either the blended home family or the family home downsizing book. So the offer is if you want to get an autographed copy of either one of the, the first two books for purchase, they're $17 each plus shipping. If you want to buy a copy of Downsizing the Blended Home or Downsizing the Family Home, we'll throw in a free bonus copy of Downsizing the Family Home workbook which would retail for $15. So if you want to take advantage of that, just shoot us an email at marnie at marniejameson.com and use the subject line Spark Joy Special and tell us which book you want to purchase. And we'll get in touch with you and get a credit card payment over the phone and send you two books for the price of one. Perfect. Thanks so much for that amazing offer. And again, if you'd like to take a shot at that bonus book, Downsizing the Family Home, a workbook, please do send a message to Marnie at MarnieJameson.com. Marnie is offering this to 10 lucky SparkJoy listeners who purchase either Downsizing the Blended Home or Downsizing the Family Home through Marnie at MarnieJameson.com. Thank you, Marnie, so much. We was just delighted to have you on the show today. Well, it was an honor for me. I always like to talk to like-minded people like you and together we'll make the world a little tidier place, won't we? Yes. Thanks so much for talking <laughs> all the things home and lifestyle. We are so happy to have you today. My pleasure. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning tidying questions or share stories about how Kanmari has impacted your life. Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and review the show, which helps us reach others along their tidying journeys. To extend your tidying experience, you can join the Spark Joy Club. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click join the club to become a member of the Spark Joy community or join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy.
thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your hosts, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast, is not endorsed by or affiliated with Kamari Media, Inc. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Kamari Media, Inc. or the Kamari Consultant Community.